Boycotting the State of the Union. He cannot govern. Hunting a neo-Nazi. And the wall that didn't come down. Trump administration officials discuss trying to reverse an undocumented teen's abortion, according to documents obtained exclusively by Vice News. The teen was undergoing a medical abortion, which involves taking two different pills, 24 to 48 hours apart. After she'd taken the first pill, an official asked the clinic handling her case about the safety of using the hormone progesterone to reverse an abortion. That idea has never been scientifically proven. There's no evidence that the officials actually tried it. The Office of Refugee Resettlement, part of the Department of Health and Human Services, has tried to block several undocumented teenagers in its custody from ending their pregnancies. Its parent agency declined to comment for this story. Brenda Fitzgerald, the director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, resigned today after a report that she bought shares in a tobacco company while leading the agency. Part of the CDC's mission is to fight smoking and prevent children from getting addicted. Yesterday, Politico reported that Fitzgerald, who became head of the agency in July, bought between $1,000 and $15,000 worth of shares in Japan Tobacco in August. She didn't sell the stocks until the end of October. In announcing Fitzgerald's resignation, the Department of Health and Human Services said her, quote, complex financial interests limited her ability to complete all of her duties. An Amtrak train carrying Republican lawmakers crashed into a garbage truck outside Charlottesville, Virginia, leaving one person in the truck dead. At least five people have been reported injured. None of the members of Congress on board the train were seriously hurt. The group, which included House Speaker Paul Ryan, was traveling to an annual retreat in West Virginia. Officials are still investigating the cause of the crash. South Carolina Representative Trey Gowdy announced today he will not be seeking re-election. He'll be leaving politics entirely. Gowdy, a Republican, is the chairman of the House Committee on Oversight and Reform, and he ran the highly polarizing House Select Committee on Benghazi. Unlike other Republicans who have announced their retirement, Gowdy was not facing a difficult re-election. He's a former federal prosecutor, and he said today that he'll be returning to work in law, which he said he enjoys more than politics. The FBI is publicly challenging the accuracy of a controversial secret memo authored by Republicans on the House Intelligence Committee. The memo reportedly claims that the Justice Department based its surveillance of a Trump associate on politically tainted intelligence. In a statement, the FBI said it only had a limited opportunity to review the memo, and that it has, quote, grave concerns about material omissions of facts that fundamentally impact the memo's accuracy. The House Intel Committee Chairman, Devin Nunes, released his own statement, accusing the FBI of withholding facts of its own. President Trump has said he wants to see the memo released. <laughs> President Trump's first State of the Union speech was supposed to be all about unity, a hand across the aisle. So tonight, I am extending an open hand to work with members of both parties not surprisingly, Democrats didn't take it that way. During the speech, they mostly sat while Republicans stood and cheered Trump on. And 14 Democrats didn't even bother to attend in the first place. Hello. Hi. Come on in. Hi, Jan Tchaikovsky. Evan, nice to see you. It's Hi. a pleasure. Hi. Hi. Representative Jan Tchaikovsky has served in Congress since 1999. This was the first State of the Union address she didn't watch from inside the House chamber since she was elected. 14 Democrats decided not to go. Right. Is that enough to make any sort of statement? My personal statement is the emperor has no clothes. But you're like a really strong progressive, so it's not too surprising that any Republican president's State of the Union would not sort of no, jibe no. with this you. This is not any president. I don't want him to be normalized. It is not normal. Mr. Speaker, the president's cabinet. I hear they come. God. What do you guys all talk about in this milling around period when we're watching you all? Well, I, you know, we'll also be identifying people, making snide comments about how they look. <laughs> you know, it's small talk, but uh -huh. uh, it's sort of gossipy. Watching the speech with Sikowski and her aides was like an episode of Mystery Science Theater 3000. Oh, that is a joke. Where the movie wasn't so bad, it was good. It just really pissed the robots off. 
Here's my theory of Donald Trump and the art of the deal. He is not really about a, a win-win situation. If he's a winner, you have to be a loser. So what impact does that have on being a member of Congress? It makes How does it, impact it really, you? really hard to, uh, to, to find a compromise. Even things that sounded pretty benign were not to Schakowsky. After years and years of wage stagnation, we are finally seeing rising wages. Now, actually, do you have those uh, charts on wages? Oh, he's brought uh, yeah. material. Uh, live rapid response. Where's, where's the wage thing? Uh, right here. At the this is better than Twitter, Congresswoman. I can just see it actually happening a lot. Stock line. market booming, but wages for working Americans remain flat. American wages rose a sluggish 2.5% last year. So this is not about success for ordinary people. I mean, he did say that they rose, and they did rise 2.5%. Sluggish. He didn't say sluggish. That's <laughs> And already touchy subjects like immigration were really touchy subjects. We focus on the immediate family by limiting sponsorships to spouses and minor children. This is how you build community by bringing family, family together. This is just base voters for him. This is mean. It feels mean to you. So mean. In recent weeks, two terrorist attacks in New York were made possible by the visa lottery and chain migration. Chain. We, you know, we had chain migration. People came in chains at the bottom of boats. It was called slavery. That was chain migration. This is family unification that we're talking about and that he's calling chain migration. After almost 90 minutes of a relatively calm speech by President Trump, Schakowsky's evening ended where it began. Do you feel like there's anything in that speech that makes you feel like there's going to be a compromise on immigration? No, not at all. The absolute worst, this was an anti-immigrant speech. Anything in the speech made you feel like there's going to be a compromise deal on like a budget? The, he cannot govern. These Republicans cannot govern. So that, that's a no on the budget. That's a no on the budget. What about infrastructure? Doesn't sound good to me, no. Do you think he made the right call not to go? Absolutely. It was like he made a decision to just veer right to his base. There was some fairly soaring language sure. um, that, that he did that, you know, um, picked at the heartstrings of Americans. I, I, I get that. I'm a patriot. I believe in the greatness of our country. But it was at the expense of, uh, a, a, of a lot of people that he does not respect. One of the president's big policy announcements last night was that he signed an order to keep the prison at Guantanamo Bay open. We continue to have all necessary power to detain terrorists wherever we chase them down, wherever we find them. And in many cases, for them, it will now be Guantanamo Bay. In addition to housing 41 remaining inmates, Guantanamo is also home to one of the most convoluted legal proceedings in American history. Earlier this month, the military judge overseeing the trial of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who's accused of planning the 9-11 attacks, announced that he himself did nothing wrong in allowing the government to destroy one of the so-called black sites where the defendant was held. That a judge should be allowed to rule on his own actions is at best darkly comic. But at the center of the Gitmo legal saga is something deadly serious whether justice for the 9-11 attacks will ever be served, and whether in pursuing it, the U.S. government committed crimes of its own. The trial of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the alleged mastermind of the 9-11 attacks, has been going on for almost a decade, and yet it hasn't really started at all. That's because defense lawyers and the prosecution have been stuck in a battle over what the CIA did to KSM in the years after he was detained. Thanks to the work of investigators, we know that KSM was one of a number of so-called high-value detainees who were held in a network of CIA secret facilities, or black sites, where they were tortured. The black sites were located in remote places around the world, first in Thailand and Afghanistan, later in parts of Eastern Europe, like Poland and Lithuania. They were typically bland structures that seemed to have almost been designed to be hard to remember with cramped cells and miserable conditions, and so little ambient light and sound that some witnesses compared them to modern-day dungeons. But here's the thing. Even after so much time has passed, 
the government still won't acknowledge any of this. It won't confirm the locations of the black sites, or who was held where, or when, or what exactly happened to them. It won't even let defense attorneys like David Nevitt, who represents KSM in his death penalty case, conduct their own research. We've been told that if we so much as approach a CIA agent and say, what do you know about the torture of my client, you're told you'll be committing a crime if you do that. The lawyer's goal here is to come up with an accurate timeline of the torture. Under the Constitution, torture is supposed to be disqualifying, so any confession made in its wake should be inadmissible, even in a military court. They also hope it might help sway the jury during sentencing. Evidence of torture often convinces jurors to skip the death penalty. That's why the defense attorneys had wanted to visit one of the actual black sites. Alka Pradhan represents Amar al-Balushi, one of Osama bin Laden's suspected couriers. Just standing in the site can tell you what conditions were like at a certain time of year, the temperature in the site, the line of sight from a detainee cell out into the hallway, uh, the fixtures in a detainee cell, whether there was uh, there were shackling points. Even if a site has been cleansed, you can go in with a forensic expert and find out quite a lot. We need to be able to say that on this day, we know that these things happened to him, that he was you know, tortured with water and that he was beaten up and that he was given a traumatic brain injury and stripped naked and you know, being shackled to a point on the floor. In that sense, what the lawyers are asking for is incredibly basic, a full accounting of the war on terror. Savages. Andrew Anglin, founder of the Daily Stormer, is one of the world's most notorious neo-Nazis. In April, the Southern Poverty Law Center filed a civil suit against him, claiming he harassed and intimidated a Jewish woman in Montana by urging his readers to unleash a troll storm. Hundreds of threatening messages targeting her and her 12-year-old son. But the case could be dismissed because Anglin is nowhere to be found. He's hiding out to avoid getting served with court documents. All right. He's at the bar across the street. Come on. Fuck. Jeff Cremains is the process server hired to serve Andrew Anglin. He works with his niece, Erica, who's also his protege. Cremains has been searching for England since last April. He just received a call from an informant saying England had been at a downtown steakhouse and then fled into this hotel. That guy sitting in that chair right there, that's not one of your, of your people, is it? Because Erica said he's, he's been here the whole time since we've been here. Can you, can, you see his, can you see his phone from there? What's he doing? Just like Facebook or something? All right, 10-4. All right, bye. He's on Facebook. <laughs> Erica could see right in his phone. Boy, just knowing he's in here is just. Mm. What does it feel like? I, it, it's, it's. I'm happy about it, but I'm also frustrated. I don't know where he's at in here, and I can't. There's not really a whole heck of a lot I can do right now. The old game of hide and seek. Cremaine said it was his best tip in months, but later the tipster hedged, saying he wasn't a hundred percent certain. All right, there's that. That's good to go. She got a lot of people served yesterday. That's good for her. Good thing. Lawyers hire Cremains to deliver legal documents to the people they're suing. It's what you have to do to get most lawsuits started. Cremains says he's never seen someone work as hard as Anglin to duck being served. You know, people that don't want to be served make our jobs difficult. That's all there is to it, you know. Cremains has served thousands of people over 25 years. He pegs his success rate at about 90%. Pretty good, given that sometimes the defendants turn out to be dead. We go and we hand them the papers and we tell them they've been served. That's it. Glorified mailman. We've been called. Why in the age of email do you have to give them physical papers? <sighs> That's a good question. I think this proves to the court that, yes, they were indeed legally, lawfully served, and they could proceed with the case. No, we, we don't want any trouble. We're just looking for Andrew. Can you, you happen to know where Andrew's at by any chance? No. I it's a relic of a time when the only way to notify someone they were being okay. sued was with paper in person or by mail. Over time, the custom was formalized, 
and whether a court has jurisdiction over someone. Can make them appear in court, can make them pay a fine, and so on, depends on serving those papers. Adding to the pressure, if Cremains doesn't find his man, the case could be thrown out. England's lawyer, Mark Randazza, filed a motion to dismiss that focuses on the fact that his client hasn't been served. The case has dragged Cremains into a dark world and turned him, for the moment, into a professional Nazi hunter. How much did you know about this uh, alt-right white nationalist movement before you got this case? Not much at all. I had heard of like Richard Spencer, that type of thing. This case has certainly uh, educated me and a lot of others on what those guys are up to and what they're doing. Anglin claims he's not a resident of any U.S. state and is living somewhere abroad, but he's from Columbus. Online, he said he's picked up donations at his father's business here. So Cremains has looked all over the city, including at the many properties Anglin's father owns in town. Yeah, this is the building his father has his business in where Andrew has used this for an address, both to, for a mailing address, and he's received checks here. And your servers has visited here yes. many times. Yeah, we've talked to front desk people, talk, you know, again, first time they were cooperative, second time, not so much, so. Anyone connected to Anglin could bring Cremains closer to Anglin himself. We need to protect the Nazis. We need to protect the KKK. We need to protect voices that we disagree with. And when I want to shut... That includes his lawyer, Mark Randazza, who's based in Las Vegas, but showed up in Ohio. Cremains was tipped off to Randazza's flight while he was still in the air and went to the airport and recorded him. He was like about as inconspicuous as a, as a turd in a punch bowl or a dick in the mashed potatoes, you know. There was somebody there, you know, I don't know if he's a private investigator or just somebody who finds me attractive. Randazza took a photo of his own. I think I was more discreet at it than he was. He should have just come up and introduced himself and said hi and like asked me a few questions. I wasn't really following him. I just wanted to show that he was there. I was looking for Andrew England, so he's making it look like he's trying to put me down, say I'm a bad process server, bad PR, whatever, so, it, you know. That Randazza was in town looked like strong circumstantial evidence that England was too. Later that night, Randazza tweeted a photo from a steakhouse. A tipster went by and said he thought he saw England inside, sitting with a man who wasn't Randazza. But Randazza swore up and down he wasn't there to see England. Uh, I am here on an unrelated case. I'm uh, conducting a deposition of a plaintiff in a defamation case. And it's totally not Nazi stuff? Uh, no, not at all. This is actually... The day after we spoke to Randazza, England posted this on Gab, a social media network popular with white nationalists. Randazza later told us he's never met England in person. But Cremain says he has met England face to face in a chance encounter at his local grocery store, which he described in a sworn statement. I just recently um, got the video surveillance back of the Meyer store okay. when I was there. And if you guys want to watch that, I can go over that with you. Yes, I very much. I just got it this morning, so let's check that out. In December, Cremains was shopping with his son when he spotted Anglin at the self-checkout, buying protein powder. But he couldn't serve him because he didn't have the papers with him. There's Angel Anglin right there, his white little powder. He even looks over at me, clear as day. Then he walks up, he's looking at me. This is where I see him take out his wallet. And, oh, nope, he puts down his wallet and gets out this white envelope. God, it's so him. It's, it's him. Now, is it possible that is just someone who looked kind of no. like him, another short no. guy? No, because I've watched so many videos of him. I've seen so many pictures of him, all the facial features, everything. It, it was him. I'm 110% sure of it. And what would be the penalty if you misrepresented anything? Oh, my gosh. Statement? Fines, jail time, my career. Yeah, I mean, there would be a lot writing if I signed a document and was lying, or if I fabricated the story. Yeah. Wish I'd have played the lottery that day. So, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it happened. You're hunting somebody for the better part of a year. You happen to bump into this guy in a grocery store. I mean, I want to meet this guy, touch his head, and then go buy a lottery ticket. I mean, what are the odds of that? Do you think it's fitting that he, he trolls people from the safety of his computer without ever having to confront them in person? And here, he, it's again avoiding that physical Oh, yeah, yeah, there, there's a word for that. 
Uh, it, it's cowardly. Um, it's as simple as that. Yeah, he's going to keep hiding. But you're going to get him. I'm going to get him somehow, some way. The Berlin Wall was the ultimate symbol of the decades-long Cold War division between the communist Soviet bloc and the West. In the years after the Berlin Wall was symbolically knocked down in 1989, starting the path to German reunification, most of the wall was demolished. At least, that's what everyone thought. Also, seit meiner Kindheit interessiere ich mich für Geschichte und auch alles, was alt ist. Alte Bauteile, alte Gegenstände und ähnliches. Die alten Bauteile sind mir sofort aufgefallen. Mir fallen an sämtlichen Örtlichkeiten viele Sachen auf, die anderen nicht auffallen. Christian Bormanns Friends call him the German Indiana Jones. Scheiße, der ist so nicht zu finden. He spends much of his free time exploring his neighborhood in northeast Berlin. Christian has found everything, from 19th century glass bottles to World War II era bunkers. But recently, he announced through a post on his blog that he'd found something with major historical significance. A 300-foot stretch of the original Berlin Wall. Ganz klassisch für die Berliner Mauer 1 ist, ist die Einbeziehung von verschiedenen historischen, schon vorhandenen Sachen. Wir sehen hier Außenmauern von kleinen Häusern, Wohnhäusern, Gewerbehäusern. For Christian, who grew up in isolated East Berlin, the find meant a lot to him personally. Als Kind habe ich den Teil von Ostberlin als sehr kleine, eingeschlossene Gemeinde empfunden, wie ein kleines Dorf praktisch. Mit dem Fall der Mauer ist genau das Gegenteil eingeklärt. Aus dieser kleinen, in sich geschlossenen Gemeinde, was sie ja nicht wirklich war, so stellte sich für mich als Kind, aber da wurde das komplette Gegenteil ein kultureller Schmelztiegel. This is potentially the last undiscovered section of the original Berlin Wall. Die, dieser Menschenfanganlage mit dem Drahtstern drauf, mit der Signalanlage, der Leitersprosse, allem drum und dran, ist absolut erhaltenswert und einzigartig auf der Welt. Um zu merken, dass es hier ein historisch wichtiger Ort ist, müssen Sie diesen Ort erkennen. Christian actually found the wall in 1999, but chose to keep it a secret. The graffiti-covered brick structure apparently didn't attract anyone else's attention despite the fact that it's visible from a train line nearby. Zu einem ist das Grundstück jetzt einsehbar im Winter. Im Sommer sehen Sie keine drei Meter weit. Es ist alles grün. Und die üblichen Lost Place Touristen, die hierher kommen, die schauen sich den Untergrund an. Sie haben hier überall unterirdische Zugänge. Da guckt gar keiner hoch. What Christian believes he uncovered was essentially a part of the Berlin Wall 1.0, built in the early 60s and mostly made of bricks and barbed wire. Later, construction of the wall was much larger and made of concrete. While official records suggested this older stretch had been demolished, Christian says these city maps indicate otherwise. Hier kam es zu einer baulichen Besonderheit. Hier ist auf dem Lila gestreiften ist Mauer 1 stehen geblieben. Es gab keinen Grund, im rückwärtigen Sperrland die Mauer zu entfernen. Since Christian disclosed the wall's location, it's become an attraction of sorts for curious locals. But now he's working on getting it officially recognized as a piece of the original wall by Berlin's local government. Also für die Gesellschaft ist es sehr wichtig, für die jungen Menschen ist es wichtig, dass sie nicht nur Bücher haben, die man ihnen vor die Nase legt, sie müssen etwas zum Anfassen haben. Sie müssen schauen, anfassen, riechen, fühlen, dann bekommen sie Geschichte auch mit. That's Vice News tonight for Wednesday, January 31st. 